everyone, my name is Natalie and welcome to Cornerstone. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we're glad you're here and we're looking forward to our time together. For those of you in our auditorium, make sure you reference your COVID-19 cheat sheet for information on masks, social distancing, and reminders about which entrance and exit you've been assigned. The band's gonna get started. Let's step into a time of worship together.
sails and may we allow the spirit of the living God to move through those sails and as we always do we come with expectation we come with surrender Holy Spirit have your way may you inhabit the praises of your people
you and thank you for the chance to gather to worship you. I pray our attention and our affection be brought back into alignment that you are good and all that you do is good. Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. I grew up with three brothers. I have one older brother and two younger. And I remember my brothers were allowed to go out by themselves, whether it was going to the store or going to meet a friend and I was not allowed to do that. My mom wanted me to to go with someone else and I remember feeling frustrated and thinking but my brothers get to do this how how come I don't? When we were visiting my my parents family friends in Philadelphia and they had three boys um, super rambunctious and I remember my sister and I we were asked to clear the table which was not um, uncommon we always did um, but the boys were sent outside and I remember just thinking, wait a minute, this, this doesn't really make sense. Like why are we cleaning, clearing the table and then kind of cleaning the dishes when they were able to run around and enjoy themselves outside? I'm Estelle. I've been going to Cornerstone for about two years. I am a technical recruiter. I also work in HR and have an interest in diversity and inclusion. I had an experience in which I was functioning as an office manager, kind of dealing with administrative tasks, also doing various tasks including carrying heavy boxes and putting together furniture. And I had an experience where I had completed some of those tasks and a manager assumed that the men in the office had did it. They didn't think that I would have done it and assumed that some of that was gender-based and that was, was frustrating. I'm Christy Lewis and I live in Lafayette, Colorado. About 10 years ago I started Quinn Foods. When I started Quinn in a male dominant industry, I almost felt like I had to change my personality and change my style of communication, which was really hard for me. Um, and I did that so I could fit in and it was it was changing from sweet to aggression and I, I felt like I had to kind of up my game if I wanted to play with the big boys in, a, in a, a very conventional space. One of the things that has really struck me from scripture is the fact that women were the first to be charged to proclaim the resurrection and to me that sends a pretty strong message that Jesus has an incredibly high esteem for women and the capabilities that we have and that we're trusted with that type of message. That gives me a lot of hope for how women can bring their abilities and their talents to the church and to their careers and beyond, knowing that we have that type of, of trust and credibility in God's eyes. Everyone is equal. Every single person on this planet is equal and we all deserve to be treated as equals. And as a, you know, a child of God, um, we are all very, very different and unique in our beliefs and our ways and 
outside of gender, color, race, there's one thing that kind of unites us as all, and it's equality. It's, it's faith around being kind to every single person that you know, regardless of what they're going through and where they come from. So that's what I, I try and teach my, my three boys, um, and what I would expect that they will teach their children, um, and it's how we run our companies. Um, but it's the understanding that um, faith is a huge part because we are children of God. Thank you, Estelle and Christy, for being vulnerable and for giving us a little window into your experience as women in this world. And, you know, during this series, we, we're shining a light on three current issues, politics, gender, and race. And last Monday and Tuesday night, we had Zoom discussions on politics. I'm going to let you know later in this message about an opportunity to be part of some discussions on racial justice. And we're going to dive into gender equality after the first of this year. Our focus on these three issues will be a one and done, not, will not be a one and done exploration. We plan on keeping these issues out in front of us a variety of ways now and through next year and even beyond, hopefully. So keep watching for opportunities. Uh, we'll let you know as they come up, okay? Um, 2020, this is like an understatement, right? 2020 has been quite a year, hasn't it? We've been mentioning it almost every week, but with the election just two days away, who knows what else is in store for the days ahead of us? Well, the answer is God knows, which means that we shouldn't be too freaked out by whatever takes place, but rather we should be ready to meet anything that happens head, head on with a posture that's consistent with being a follower of Jesus. One that's full of faith and courage and, and patience and kindness and grace, which is why we started our current Peacemaker series anticipating that as challenging and divisive as 2020 has already been, it may worsen in the days and months ahead. And we felt that understanding how to be peacemakers is vital for today so vital that we've added it to the current list of Cornerstone's nine values that define who we are as a faith community. The passage we're using as a foundation for this current series is Matthew 5, 9, and it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And before I move on to talk about today's topic, I want to ask an important question about this passage, and here's my question. If we are going to be called a child of God for being peacemakers, who is the one doing the calling? Is it God or is it other people? And I, I want to suggest that the answer is other people because the spiritual status of a child of God is based solely on faith, not on works. Through faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross to atone for our sins, we become adopted into God's spiritual family. When that adoption transaction transpires, God now considers us his forever sons and daughters. And whether we are peacemakers or not, nothing can change that forever status because it's not based on works, it's based on faith. But when we live as peacemakers... We're now behaving like we're actually one of God's children. And when we do that, people take notice. And they'll say something like, hey, you're one of God's kids, right? And that's probably why Jesus says, blessed or happy are the peacemakers. For they will be called or they'll be noticed as God's children. And the importance of behaving like we're actually one of God's children is the essence of my message today. Because as you'll soon discover, behaving like this is how he created, how God created all of humanity to live when he decided to make us in his image. He could have made us like the rest of the animal world, but he put something uniquely inside of us that is called his image. And that makes us different from the rest of creation. I've said this many times in the past. My dog never comes to me and says, what's the meaning of life? He never says, I feel so unsatisfied with my life right now. All he really cares about is when he's going to eat and when he's going to poop. Only humans 
ask these kinds of existential questions. And we ask them simply because we're made in God's image. And so today, I'm going to talk about what it means to be made in the image of God. Something that Brian and I have taught on many occasions in the past, even as recent as just four months ago in our beginning series, because we believe that the implication of God's image is one of the most important concepts to understand, especially for the times we're living in right now. And yet, as often as we have taught on this subject in the past, I've got to be honest with you, we're a little baffled about how little this teaching has impacted the divisive and mean behaviors that persist in so many who listen to our messages. And so I'm asking, I'm asking that for the next 30 minutes, that everyone listening to this message would please tune in with every part of their being. And I'm also asking that you would have one of two responses to this message. Number one, if you feel that I am wrong about what I'm about to teach, then please contact me or Brian to explain why you feel that way. Or number two, if what I'm about to teach resonates with you, then please do all you can to let it impact your life the way this teaching demands. This teaching is the most important concept to understand about how best to live our lives here on earth, which I am calling human destiny, or how best to relate to all of humanity, which I'm calling human dignity. In his book, On the Image of God, author John Kilner says, many see humanity's creation in God's image as central, at the heart of, in fact, the most important matter in theological anthropology. And I totally agree with him, 200%, uh, because I believe that it's absolutely impossible to understand what it means to be human if we don't first understand what it means to be made in the image of God. And both human destiny, which is how we're supposed to live our lives, and human dignity, which is how we're supposed to treat others, are theological, they are God-logical functions of being made in God's image, and we're going to look at both of them today. The title of this message is, What is the Image of God? Uh, What is the Image of Humanity? And the short answer to this question is, God is the image of humanity, because we're all made in His image. And I'm hoping to deliver a message that is both fresh and hopefully interesting one that will hold your attention for the next 30 minutes or so. But please do everything on your part to seriously consider and absorb what I am about to say because this is something we all need to be on the same page about. Our text is Genesis 1.27, and here's what it says. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. The Hebrew words for image of God in the sentence are Betzalem Elohim. It's also known in Latin as Imago Dei. So let's just dive right in and first look at how God's image determines human destiny, all right, which is about how we are supposed to live our lives. Every human being ever created is made in God's image and as a result has a destiny to live out whether they are aware of it or not and this human destiny not only includes where we are ultimately going but what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it along the journey to where we're ultimately going destiny is about life purpose Many of the great movies that we love have uh, unlikely heroes who rise up in the face of some horrible dilemma, right? To fulfill their destiny by becoming leaders against those causing the dilemma. In Braveheart, William Wallace fulfills his destiny by leading his fellow Scots in the first Scottish War of Independence. In Mulan, a young woman named Mulan fulfills her destiny by defying gender stereotypes in order to release her people from the evil grip of Chinese leader Bori Khan. In Star Wars, young Luke Skywalker fulfills his destiny by standing up against the dark forces of evil, led sadly by his own father, Darth Vader. I bet he had some father issues. In each of these stories, 
And there are countless stories just like them. There's an implied sense of destiny for their mission. Destiny is about life purpose. And being made in God's image defines our destiny as we reflect his image in wherever our mission leads us. Again, John Kilner says it so eloquently. Listen to this. It's beautiful. Our reflection of God is the beauty of human destiny. Listen to that again. Our reflection of God is the beauty, is the beauty of human destiny. Just chew on that little nugget for a moment. See where that takes you. To bear God's image means to reflect God's characteristics. It means to live like God would live if he were here on earth. It means to have a life pursuit of growing in our understanding of God's characteristics in such a way that we embrace them as our own characteristics. You know, throughout the ages, famous people have always influenced things like fashion and hairstyles and even behavior. I wish I had a photo to show you, but I was so influenced by the Beatles as a teenager, I imitated their characteristics. I had long hair, I wore a Nehru jacket, I had striped bell-bottom linen pants, I wore four-inch platform shoes, and multiple strings of really cool beads hanging around my neck. Unfortunately, I also imitated their bad drug habits as well. James Dean inspired countless young men to wear white t-shirts um, with a pack of cigs rolled up on one of the sleeves. A British group called the Beastie Boys influenced men to wear a mullet hairstyle. Jennifer Aniston of Friends influenced women to wear the Rachel hairstyle. And a music group called the Bangles influenced millions of people to walk like an Egyptian. Dun, 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 dun. We've all been influenced in one way or another by someone we looked up to and wanted to emulate. Whether they were positive or negative Role models, And we do this partly because we believe that when we reflect the image of that person, it makes us look super cool. And this is totally normative behavior. And if that image reflect, reflection comes from a positive role model, it's a really good thing. But the, rea- the reality is that no human being is created in anyone's image except God's image. And so when we reflect his image, we're actually living in sync with the way God created us. Listen to this. Let it, let it just soak in. The true essence of what it means to be human is to reflect God's character in such a way that it informs every aspect of how we live our life here on earth. That's also exactly what it means to glorify God. And let me tell you, there is no better way to live a more meaningful and exciting life, not only for us, ourselves, but also for those who intersect with us on our fateful journey. And if you really want to be the coolest dude on the planet, all you have to do is start reflecting God's characteristics. And since God's characteristics are all an inside job, meaning they're internal, not external, it really doesn't matter how you look on the outside. So have fun finding that awesome look that is uniquely you. Go for it. Okay, so first and foremost, foremost, image determines human destiny. It defines what and how we're supposed to do uh, with our lives here on earth, how we're supposed to live them out. Secondly, certainly not any way in the least, Image determine, determines human dignity, which is about how we are supposed to treat others. Our text said God created both male and female in the image of God. And I know that in our modern world today, male and female doesn't quite cover all the human identity classifications that exist. 
And without any judgment about these classifications, God's intent in making this declaration about male and female is simply to ensure that it covers the entirety of humanity and not just genders, right? All colors, all ethnicities, all religions, all ages, any and all human classifications or identities that we can put a label on. They're all covered. And by human dignity, we're talking here about assigning a God-given worth, equality, and respect to everyone that's not predicated on anything other than being made in his image. In other words, it's not based on being a conservative or a liberal, a Republican or a Democrat, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, a good person like Mother Teresa, a bad person like Adolf Hitler, a God worshiper or a Satan worshiper, a super good look looking person like myself, or, e- or even someone who looks like, well, Brian Carlucci. Every human being who's ever lived in the past or will live in the future is made in the image of God, and because of this, deserves to be treated with human dignity, and for that reason, and for that reason alone, period, end of story. One of my favorite passages in the Bible about this subject is Ezekiel 18.23. When's the last time you looked up that verse, okay? Here's what it says. This is God speaking. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, and the answer is no, right? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? You know, sometimes Bible teachers frame God as this really pissed off, bloodthirsty deity who's obsessed with destroying bad guys. And although God does promise justice either in this life or in the life to come for all those who have been mistreated, don't ever think that God enjoys this even just a tiny bit. Because even the wickedest of people are still made in his image. And God would rather have them repent so they can discover their true human destiny rather than see them perish and face the consequences of their wicked actions. That's God's heart right there. And this word, Hebrew word teshuva, which means turning around or to turn around, meaning repenting and then living to reflect God's image is what brings God great pleasure. Pleasure, not vengeance. Vengeance does not bring God pleasure. One of the earliest church fathers following the first apostles, we're talking really early in church history, a man named Clement of Rome said this. Towards the end of the first century, he said, you should do good to and pray honor and reverence to man who is made in the image of God. Minister food to the hungry Drink to the thirsty, clothing to the naked, hospitality to the stranger, necessary things to the prisoner, and that is what will be regarded as truly bestowed upon God. So it's like you're doing this for God, right? Jesus said, as much as you do that to the least of one of these, you've done it unto me. This list is taken from that chapter in, in Matthew 25, where Jesus is teaching on the least of these. And notice how prisoners are included in this exhortation, because despite what they've done, Whatever they've done to earn a ticket to prison, they're still made in God's image and therefore deserve to be treated with human dignity. Those people, everybody on that list, are the vulnerable, the at risk, the marginalized. And that's why Jesus calls them the least of these, not by God's measurement, but by society's measurement. And we're exhorted to do whatever we can to lift them up, to restore human dignity to their lives, depending on the situation they are in. Food for those who are hungry, drink for those who are thirsty, clothes for those who are naked, hospitality for those who are aliens, companionship for those who are imprisoned. Why? Simply because they are made in God's image. And for that reason alone, they are worthy of this special attention. And this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. It's merely meant to underscore how important it is to treat each and every person on this planet with human dignity. But especially, 
especially those who are vulnerable and at risk and marginalized. You know, almost all the great justice movements of the past were built upon the belief that every human being has intrinsic value simply because they're made in God's image. Especially the movement to bring racial justice. In the fourth century, so we're talking early on in history, a church leader named Gregory of Nyssa wrote this to slave owners. This is what he wrote to slave owners. What price did you put on the likeness of God? Who is his seller? To God alone belongs this power, or rather, not even to God himself, for this gracious gift. It says, the gracious gifts are irrevocable. From Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, God does not enslave what is free. It's beautiful. Fast forward to 1860 as the Civil War is getting underway, and journalist Orestes Brownson wrote a piece appealing to slave owners as well that they were stifling what is human in enslaved people and preventing the development in them of that image and likeness of God in which they were created. Martin Luther King used the image of God as the foundational basis for his fight against racial inequality. And although in America we've made some significant progress over the decades, recent events tell us that we have a lot more work to do. A week from this Monday evening, Osei May and myself are going to host a three-week uh, discussion on racial justice on Zoom. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that from Natalie right after this message. So I encourage you to, uh, to, to, to join in, become more informed um, as we take a look at this important issue. The image of God demands human dignity. Not just for people we like, not just for people who are good, it demands human dig dignity for everyone. This doesn't mean that people who do wrong are not gonna be held accountable for their actions, it simply means they should never stop being treated with human dignity. And the reality that everyone is made in God's image should inform how we engage in things like politics and racial equality and gender equality and any other issue that we can think of. It sits foremost, it's primary to everything else. And I encourage you, let's just get practical here. Before you post or share a post on your social media, before you send a text or an email or have a conversation, ask yourself the question, am I treating this person with the intrinsic value that comes from being made in God's image? Am I conveying human dignity or am I dehumanizing or demonizing them? If we want to be called a child of God, a peacemaker, a bridge builder, then it requires an understanding that the image of God is intended first and foremost to lead to human destiny, living our lives with a divine purpose, and secondly, human dignity, treating everyone, every human being with the intrinsic value that they deserve. This is what the image of God demands. This is what being a child of God demands of us. And I want to finish by sharing how Jesus fits into all of this, right? How does Jesus fit into all of this? Well, listen to this. Hebrews 1.3 says, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Colossians 1.15 says that the Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. And so if you want to know how the image of God plays out perfectly in a human being here on earth, we only have to look to how Jesus lived his life here on earth. And this could be a series on its own. Maybe we'll do this in the future. But I just want to dial it down. I want to leave you with one passage of scripture from Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 8. This passage specifically addresses how we are supposed to live our lives based on how Jesus lived his life. So keep that in mind. And I want to read it using the Lectio Divina format that we use here often at Cornerstone. I'll read it three times. Each time I'll give you something to contemplate as I read the text. 
And so wherever you're at, if you're, you're in your living room or you're in your bedroom or you're in your bathroom, wherever you, you like to go and watch our, our sermons, our Sunday morning services, put down your Bibles, put down your cell phones, put down your journals, take a deep breath, and would you commit to allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal something to you through this exercise number one how does this passage reveal how we should live our lives based on how Jesus lived his life here's what the passage says do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit rather in humility value others above yourself not looking to your own interests but each of you to the interests of others In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. I'm going to read it again. This time focus on the words value others above yourself and try to connect that to some challenging relationship you may have in your life right now. Here it is again. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And this last time, ask the Holy Spirit to put to death anything in you that might keep you from living this way. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Lord Jesus, we thank you that, number one, you came to earth to show us how a person in the image of God is to live their life, and you lived it in a radical way. May we learn from you about human destiny, how we're supposed to live our lives, and human dignity, how we're supposed to treat others. As we watch how you lived, Lord, Holy Spirit, may you infuse that into our DNA, that we would have God's DNA, his image living out, growing in us day by day, taking on his characteristics more and more as each day goes by. And may we live it out here in our faith community, in our city, in our nation, and in the world. Lord, may it have an impact on us that people would look and say, hey, there goes one of God's kids. 
And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So Natalie's going to come up and share a few things with you before we close for the morning. And uh, here she comes. All right. Thanks, Jean and the worship team for this time that we've got to spend together. I feel like every week I have something new to process through and think about. Um, but I do have a couple of announcements before we go. We've got some MomHood Zoom connections coming up in the next few weeks in November. Our first one is this Tuesday, November 3rd, and we're going to be diving into the teen years. So if you want to connect with other moms, please email momhood at cornerstoneboulder.org to get that Zoom link. If you want to know the rest of the Zoom connections we have planned for November and December, you can check out all those details on our MomHood webpage of our main site. As Jean mentioned, this past week we got to host a Zoom discussion group on politics and it's a way to kind of put this Peacemaker series into practice and we are going to continue to press into what it means to be a peacemaker in our society today with the Zoom discussion group on race in November. It's going to start on Monday, November 9th. It's going to be a three-week Zoom discussion group. So you do need to register so we can send you the link and any pertinent information. You can register for that group on our upcoming events tab of the website. If you're new to our community, we would love to get you connected to one of our ongoing groups, whether that's one of our life groups, women's Bible study, one of our Zoom discussion groups. We've got lots of different things going on and we wanna help you find your people. So go to our cornerstoneboulder.org homepage, click on the I'm new button to get started and we'll be in touch. And lastly, giving. Um, we think it's pretty cool that we get to partner with each other to see some amazing things happen around the world and in Boulder County. And if you want to partner with us in giving, you can find secure ways to do that on our app and our website. All right, for those of you watching at home, we're going to move into some dismissal instructions real quick. So feel free to go ahead and sign off. We'll see you again next week. But for those of you in the room, I need you to listen real quick for a couple of instructions. First, I need my families with families with kids in kids church to exit these doors to my right there are some purple dots that are on the hallway down there so that you can line up and wait for your kiddos and still be socially distanced uh, for everyone else give them just a couple minutes to get out these doors and then we have three exits you can use we have an exit in the very back of our auditorium by our balcony stairs that actually goes directly to the parking lot we have another exit in the back of our auditorium that goes out to our courtyard and then of course we have our front exit so we are going to be cleaning uh, in between services so uh, please maintain maintain some social distance as we exit the building, but we're really glad we got to spend our time together this morning. Stay classy, Cornerstone. We'll see you again next week.